Welcome to the Layman Seminary. A few minutes ago, uh, uh, probably around uh, 1251, I mean 1151, it's 1213 now, I said I was going to try to go to sleep. I laid down and I crashed hard. <laughs> and believe it or not, I had a dream that I met President Obama driving a limousine and uh, he was take, he was asking us where we wanted to eat and, and he was asking if we liked fowl, like the bird or something. I don't know, weird dream, but it's raining right now, so I don't know if I'm going to lose power or not, but I got to keep going, got to keep motivated, you know, because I got deadlines coming up for not only for this paper, but also for a Hebrew one and a presentation. So with that said, uh, I'll pray real quick and we'll continue. Father God, I just pray right now that you would help me to have insight, Lord, and to how to fix up this paper some, Lord, and also help the audience out there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if I didn't explain already, the whole purpose I'm doing these videos is to motivate myself to work on this paper. Because if I read silently, uh, I can't do a good job. Not because I can't understand it, but I just can't, you know. But if I read out loud to someone else, I can get into it more. And so um, I'm reading to you all. <laughs> all right. So I left right here. This section is something I wrote. Uh, and I'm going to integrate it, but right now I'll just read it without the integration, and then we'll start going through verse by verse and looking at what I have so far. Uh, don't worry about indentation. I can fix all that later on. Now, like I said, my goal is to cut things down in this paper. Paul's introduction to the book immerses the reader into Paul's doctrine of sanctification. Paul explicitly uses the word saint for his recipient in 1.7. Before addressing the recipient, Paul describes his calling and the content of his message in 1.6. This description is the beginning of Paul's presentation of the doctrine. Oh, there we go. Uh, and, and that sounds similar to, where was it? I saw the doctrine of sanctification just a moment ago. Yeah, immerse readers. Okay. All right. That's close enough. I'll keep it like that even though he would not formally deal with it into the middle of the book and that's talking about the sanctification section that most people you know address he prepares his audience to embrace all aspects and implications of the doctrine of sanctification paul is a jewish christian that calls himself a bond servant he describes christ in the content of his message christ is the davidic son even though the davidic kingdom has not yet been established Paul, and so that's letting you know I'm pre meal there, and I'm not, uh, I'm a, a normative dispensationalist, not a progressive dispensationalist, so I'm not saying it's already, I'm saying it's not yet, excuse me. Paul alludes about the Davidic covenant and the Abrahamic covenant in the Jewish opening. He alludes to the Abrahamic covenant by way of inclusio. In the same chapter, he, he, is, he is an explicit example of someone uh, Let's add the word Paul here just to make that more clear. Paul's an explicit example of someone who avoids the sins mentioned in Romans 1 and 2. Thus, Paul is introducing himself as a theocratic administrator. That's still pretty broken, but like I said, I'm going to integrate it in. So let's see what we got here. All right, Romans 1. Like I told y'all in the last video, what I did was I went through and I would... I wrote, I pasted all the verses and then I put footnotes related to that verse that were mentioned in those other resources of uh, preaching Romans, four perspectives on Paul, the two sanctification books with all the different views in it, um, those resources. Um, and whenever I felt like I covered something, what I did was I wrote a descriptive summary uh, of that particular verse and then uh, deleted the scripture um, passage. Okay, so like, for example, right here, we have Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul's calling relates to the doctrine of sanctification. Now, that's more of a title, and that's why it's in a different color. So we could actually put it like this. Uh, and here's the description, and it will not always be in this bold, um, but for right now it is. Uh, let me just go ahead and kill the bold right now. Uh, I'll keep the font, but Paul calls himself a bondservant of Christ that serves explicitly as 
an apostle because he is set apart for the gospel of God. I don't think explicitly is the right word. Um, specifically is what it's supposed to be. Serve specifically as a called apostle because he is set apart for the gospel of God. So that's my summary of the very first, uh, first one. All right, so I can do a couple things here. One, I mentioned some stuff up here that relate to that. So I could think about, okay, what do I, what can I cut? What can I keep? Do I need to integrate anything in here? Um, also, it's probably helpful. I'm going to close my document. I don't need that. Um, it's probably helpful that if I go back to the passage and I have it open in front of me fresh so that I can uh, decide what more I want to do, what I want to comment on. Okay, for some reason I'm in Samuel. Don't remember how I got there. But we're going to Romans 1. All right. Paul, bondservant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. All right. So normally, this is not the same thing as like if you were uh, making causal layouts. So basically, you could do this. You could say, Paul, that's one idea. A bondservant, that's two ideas. Or you could say, bondservant of Christ Jesus, that's all one idea. Called as an apostle, that's another idea. Set apart for the gospel of God. So if that be the case, then I might do something like this. I might say, uh, I would, let me think about this. Okay, the way I put it here, Paul calls himself. So that's my verb, a bond servant of Christ that serves specifically as a called apostle because he's separated for the gospel of God. So I have both of those ideas there. Now, if I go up here, I can look and see where I mentioned some of these to see. Paul explicitly uses the word saint for the recipient. That's fine. Before addressing the recipient, Paul describes his calling and the content of his message. That's narrowing down to one six. That's fine. The description is the beginning of Paul's presentation. That's fine. Even though he would not form a deal with it to the middle of the book. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Paul is a Jewish Christian that calls himself a bond servant. All right, so now let's look at this. Paul calls himself a bondservant of Christ to serve specifically as a called apostle because he set apart. So that is very similar. So let's go. Let's see right here. Paul, let's see if we can integrate anything here. Paul is a Jewish Christian that calls himself a bondservant. All right. This is something I can condense. Now, I may decide later on. I don't want, I don't like it. I want to do something different. But for right now. Paul is a Jewish Christian, uh, and then the word that should just, call. Paul is a Jewish Christian that calls himself a bondservant of Christ, uh, and then instead of that, we could say for serving, for serving specifically as a called apostle because he's set apart for the gospel of God. And that's, that's clear enough. Um, I don't have an issue with that. I said I can always change it later on. Okay, so that unlimited that phrase up there. He describes Christ in the content of his message. Now that came off of, I made a distinction here. Paul describes his calling and the content of his message. So if you'll notice that in outline format, that's this right here, this calling. Uh I learned this recently, that if you go right here, you can make a bolder line underneath it so you can see it better. Uh, they don't look too good, but for right now, that lets me know. So there's that, and then this one is content, uh, possibly content. We can come back to that. Um, so that's an interesting idea, right? We talked about his calling. Let's, let's, go, let's keep the content idea for right now. And let's put a parallelism into this. And let's see. We may remove this later on. Um, Paul's calling relates to the doctrine of sanctification. He describes Christ in the content of the message. So who, who's the he? Well, we're talking about Paul. 
Armistrad's Christ and the content of his message. Okay, so that's the, the gospel of God. And so this is one, two, through, uh, I don't know how far that goes. So we'll just say one, two for right now. Some of y'all might have just heard that thunder in the background. Not sure how the noise counts and stuff goes, but okay. Describes Christ and the content of his message. Okay, and and by message, I'm talking about the gospel. Um, let's see here. Christ is all right. So that makes it sound like I'm already going into verse two. Okay. Well. I've already written some other stuff in here, so let's see how this flows here. All right, so let's see. The first hint of experiential sanctification occurs in this verse when Paul calls himself a bondservant. All right, that's expounding on this. So you have a description, right? He's calling himself that, and then you have a description. Now, I may, later on, I may eliminate the, uh, the description, but for now, I'm just going to keep it that way. I could say, okay, I've accounted for everything in the text, or at least my observations. The first hint of experiential sanctification occurs in the verse of Paul calls himself a bond servant. All right. And I could actually go into about how the bond servant is an Old Testament title, honorific. You know, it's humbling, but it's also, you know, a very honorable title. Uh, I say here, he received his commission on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. Uh, and I'm going to say at that point, at that point, he was given the potential to serve God. Uh, and so that is an example of experiential sanctification. So this could, this needs to go like this. Okay. And I know there's passive voice, but like I said, I have other stuff. I can get that out of there. So, so this kind of went historical, you know, reminding us of Paul's commission. Uh, Acts 9, my goal is to keep people in Romans. Um, all right. So this looks forward. Uh, commissioned on the road to Damascus. So this is talking about ES, all right? Uh, so we could say, we could actually say, Paul was PS, and I don't know if we say PS or received PS. Uh, then here, let's do this. Paul received PS, so positional sanctification, and his commission on the road to Damascus in Acts 9. And at that point, he was given the potential to serve God. And so, you know, we may change that because we got an and and there. But for right now, I'm not really worried about it. All right. One day he will have perfect sanctification, okay, or ultimate sanctification, which we'll just put that to the side, U.S., and ultimate sanctification. Like I said, some of these acronyms are going to stay. I mean, uh, some are going to go, but it just helps me write more condensely, concisely. Um, okay. One day he would have perfect sanctification. Meanwhile, Paul served in his office and by his gifts in his unique calling. I don't think we're being too redundant. I, we got a couple words repeated that we've already said before, but it seems to be flowing okay. And plus we have Pro Writer Aid, which will highlight all the repetitions and the echoes if we want to go back and change words, office and bias gifts in his unique column. Okay, so the word describe is probably a weak descriptor, but uh, we're still using it. So this, uh, this first part, there were Paul, a bond servant of Christ, right? But now we have called an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Um, oh, I did write about the, the Old Testament title, honorific and stuff. So let's see. Verse 10 is when called a bond servant. So 
road to Damascus to the point he's given the potential to serve God. Okay, so that still goes with the service idea. One day he will have perfect uh, perfect sanctification and will serve God perfectly, I could say. Yeah, I'll go ahead and include it so people can know where I'm going and why I'm going there and will serve God perfectly in a glorified sinless body. In a glorified sinless body. Because that is talked about in the re in the other parts of Romans. So I can probably do that. that I don't think this would be a problem. Um, if not, I preserve the idea and I can always go back and scrap it later. Um, so with that said, let's go ahead and put some indentation in here so we can get a little bit of structure. Usually one paragraph, I think, is four sentences. So one... Uh, two, three, four. So we're good there. And so we can, this is more in general and we can make it more specific or we can put it together. But let's, um, I probably will include some Old Testament passages or support for this right here. But for now, this is good. Paul describes himself as a slave servant of Christ because it's an Old Testament title, honor, humility, and submission. To the master Jesus Christ. I've changed my mind. I'll put it up here. Okay. Then now we're on to the apostle part. Paul is also an apostle, which is a specific role or office uh, that he holds as a servant, that he functions in as a servant, as a bond servant. No, I think that'll work. Since this is a, uh, he served with apostolic authority and he's been set apart for the gospel. Okay, we finally got to there. Sounds good so far. Good enough at least. All right, Paul summarizes this activity as being experiential sanctification or practically set apart for the gospel of God because he's using his phrase set apart. You know, does that mean set apart? And for his, you know, he was born, like some of the prophet references or what's going on. Uh, we're just dealing with the story of Damascus, but those things may theologically be true. Um, Paul summarizes the sect as being set apart for the gospel of God. Okay. He has been set apart for the message from and about God. So that's where I'm taking the word gospel of God, set apart for the gospel of God. Uh, there was something I said earlier about the gospel, and it sounds like it will fit right in there. So I may not have to say it again because I've already clarified about the whole message thing. Um, where was it? Yes, the word gospel should be translated as message and context determines the content of the message. Now I could take this and bring it down again. I mean, it's repeated, but I can always change it later or I could scrap it. But this lets me know that I'm kind of doing a tie in to up there. Where, where am I anyway? Oh, yeah, we're past the commentary introduction part. All right. So let's just do that. The word gospel should be translated as message and context determines the content of message. So, right, because we're kind of building off of that. He has been set apart for the message from, because it's from God and about God. Okay, so I'm considering the possibility is that how the genitives are functioning there, not sure, but we can always come back to that at a later point. Uh, using God, okay, so what I'm saying is, he doesn't say the gospel according to Christ, the gospel according to his son. Later on, he will use that term, uh, the gospel of his son, and but in the very beginning, he's talking about the gospel of God. Okay, so message from and about God. When Paul uses the uh, God or, or the word God. Uh, 
uh, when Paul refers to the gospel, uh, let me put this one. When Paul refers to the object of the gospel being God, this hints, and so we can see this right here. I was already writing in that way, and the thunder's getting loud. All right. This hints. I used hint a while ago. I uh, probably would check it out later on, but this hints that Paul is writing about something more than positional sanctification. And I kind of mentioned that earlier because I mentioned the uh, Messianic salvation. So the question is, the things that I mentioned earlier, should they be brought down here or should I bring something up there? So if I go back up here to where I talk about Messiah, the Messianic salvation stuff, um, where is it? Okay. That's right after the content stuff. It does concern the Messianic salvation of the world. Christ reigns in the millennial kingdom. So the, so the reader, the paper is going to know that I've already introduced that idea. Um, so that may be okay. Well, for object of the beat, in the sense that Paul is writing about something more than PS. Okay. And uh, in addition, since I've already mentioned Messianic salvation earlier, in addition to Messianic salvation, because uh, that's one of the topics in the book, uh, the character and actions of God are revealed throughout the book, so they'll be taken as God of God's righteous and faithful vindication. So this is kind of like going to the idea that when it's talking about the righteousness of God, it's a vindication of God, maybe even a theodicy. Um, okay. All right. So I'm still on verse one. And that's probably what's going to happen is the first some parts of these going to are going to be covering a lot of introductory stuff, but there's not going to so the whole the whole if you will commentary is not going to be at the same length or the same emphasis in every place. Um, right, just a God. I, I'll put verses in later in later on. I'm just going to keep rolling here. Okay, now. This is that Nanos guy I mentioned in the other video, the Jewish guy that wrote in the Four Perspectives of Paul. And he just says some things here that I totally agree with, but I agreed with him before uh, I ever knew anything about him uh, through my own study and, you know, studying other people I respect. So um, I want to include this idea, but this this idea is not just limited to him. I didn't say, oh, wow, Nanos had this idea. Um, and I got the footnotes where I can go back in and study this, but I got to put things in my own words right now so that I can process what's going on here. Uh, and this may go in a totally different place, but I'm just going to put it here for now. All right. Israel will be restored and the mission activity, I guess you could say. Then I'll see the restoration answer as a mission that will cause. All right. So this is a this this is the idea that um here the restoration We'll just put this as like a placeholder. The restoration of Israel uh, indicates it is part of the mission. See, I really don't even like uh, this quote 
pardon, it's not a quote, but it's an idea, will cause experiential righteousness to occur. And no, that's not experiential righteousness, that's experiential reconciliation, which I just realized I may run into a problem because now I'm going to have to use a different acronym. Uh, but we'll just, we'll try to make it work and we'll see. Like I said, the acronyms may not even stay. Um, Israel indicates it is part of the mission uh, of God. Let's just use that. That will cause experiential reconciliation to God. That is very, very broken and choppy. I'm not satisfied with that one bit, but I can always go back and get it another time. Uh, so he's just saying, Nanos is just pointing out that Paul adapts for audience, but it doesn't compromise the Torah. I already know that. Um, so it's not really important information, so we can cut it. Paul was not a Christian. If Paul is a Torah observant Jew, this follows. That's him interacting with one of the reform guys, I think Shriner. Not really important information right now. I can go back and put it in if, if need to. Okay, so here was my second point. Um, I like the verses that are mentioned here. That's good. So I'll, I'll keep this as a summary to trigger back to look at that and research it. And I'll highlight it just to remind myself not to go over it again. All right, Paul disguised Christ in the content of his message. Uh... And this one, Paul's message is in harmony with the, new, the Hebrew scriptures also related to the doctrine of sanctification. I like this one better, but this could become a sub point maybe. I'm not sure we'll even need it, but, um, and I may not even need these uh, divisions. These are just helping me to organize my thoughts, right? So the content of his message. Okay, so... Here's my summary of that. God promised his gospel or his message. So I, so I can combine this together, his gospel message. Uh, I'm going to just be consistent and, and take it as message. God promised his message through the prophets written by and about them. In other words, I'm wondering, okay, is this talking about the idea that, that the message came through the prophets or because it's about them as well, about the prophets, you know? So that's a, a Greek thing if I want to consider that. Okay, so the basis for the sanctification is interesting. Is that we, we have this concept that's introduced. Uh the Hebrew scriptures are called holy. You can see that right here. And I think this was originally my uh, uh, tie-in, um, but I'll just keep it like this. The Hebrew scriptures are called holy. By holy, they... Uh, it may be I hold, as holy. By holy, they are distinctly inspired revelation of God and also the revelatory means of experiential sanctification. Okay, so I'm playing around with this distinction of revelatory means and regulatory means. Okay. Because uh, currently at this time, they're the revelatory means of experiential sanctification. But at that time, they were not the regulatory means. But then again, they in a way they were just not underneath the Mosaic Law. So I'll have to flesh that out later on. So let me just highlight that so I can come back to that. Um, Jesus referred to sanctification by the truth of the word of God in John 17. Your word is true. Sanctify them by truth. I don't think that Jesus is talking about other uh, positional or ultimate sanctification. So I'm going to go ahead and just make that ES. Jesus referred to experiential sanctification. By the truth of the word of God in John 17. Shriner, I think that's misspelled, has proposed a fulfilling scripture in Paul's framework. Okay, so 
this is the idea that when you're coming to the text, you know, you're basically trying to establish, you know, what's going on. Uh, what's the main framework behind all of Paul's writings? Well, this paper is only limited to Romans. So the argument about the framework stuff is not that important right now. I can always put it back in. Um, so Sarnia's proposal for fulfilling scripture is Paul's framework. This, this is interesting because Paul is talking about the fulfillment of scripture here, but I can always uh, bring that up later on. Because Johnson, uh, I can't remember the full name of this guy. He thinks Shriner's framework, scripture framework falls short, even though he recognizes uh, John, Romans 15.4, where it says whatever things are written for our learning uh, through the scriptures, we might attain hope or something like that. Um, so we could say scripture is mentioned i won't leave it like that but for right now that's good enough and now preserve that first so that i can come back in and and decide after my research the prophets in the hebrew scripture spoke and wrote about the father's son described as the davidic son humanly speaking and therefore the messiah now that's a summary of verse three so if we look at this oh, if we look at this, um, verse two says, which he promised beforehand, the Son of God, through the prophets in the Holy Scripture. So let's talk about that. Then it goes into about concerning his son. So the question is, have I started talking about the son uh, too fast? And so let's look at this. I don't think I'm good for right now. So... Uh, this summary for verse three is probably going to work. I'm saying it's it's perfect, but we can ride with it here. The prophets. So let's see here. The prophets in the Hebrew scripture spoke and wrote about the father's son described as the Davidic son. So the father's son would refer to his eternality and the Davidic son will refer to his kinship, humanly speaking, because it talks about according to the flesh, and therefore the Messiah. So that relates to that. Okay. Paul described the Son as gospel content because it's centered on Christ, even though it's God's gospel. Now, this is interesting because he don't say the gospel of the Son. Here it's the gospel of God because it's the Father that is... It is the Father who is promising beforehand through the prophets and the scriptures. So the focus is on the activity of the Father. And so that kind of helps us maybe up here when we were talking about why it says the characteristics of God. Um, I'm just going to write it focuses on the Father's promise. So the father is like revealing the son. Spoke and wrote about the father's son described as the Davidic human. Okay. Paul described the son as gospel content. Uh, I'm going to say instead of, yeah, I'll just keep a gospel. Because it is centered on Christ, even though it's God's gospel. Then I can mention that later on in, 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 uh, Later on, it is called, that's passive voice, but the gospel of his son. And what verse is that? Verse nine. So it's concerning his son is probably how I would take that earlier. It's the gospel of God concerning his son. And it also relates, it sounds like it relates to the deity of Christ. Okay. So we'll keep that the same. The Hebrew scriptures contain information about the son. So let's look at this. Paul describes the son as gospel content because it's centered on Christ, even though it's God's gospel. 
Um, let's see. Because that's talking about the Hebrew scriptures containing the race of the son who is set apart in the line of David. Paul's gospel in fulfillment of the Old Testament. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to combine these and then I'll maybe condense them and, and uh, all of that later on. So let's look here. The prophets in the Hebrew scriptures spoke and wrote about the father's son described as a Davidic son, humanly speaking, and therefore the Messiah. Paul described the son as gospel content because it's centered on Christ, even though it is God's gospel. Later on, it's called the gospel of son. All right. The Hebrew scriptures, that's this statement right here. So the prophets in the Hebrew scripture spoke and wrote about the father's son. Uh, so really me saying contain information about the son is just not important right now. Uh, as far as the son being set apart in the line of David. I like the idea of me using language that is similar to what it's saying about Paul. Um, let's just try that. Who described the father's son described as let's try this as set apart. In the line of David as Davidic son, described as set apart in the line of David. Well, if I just say set apart as the Davidic son, I know I'm talking about the line of David, humanly speaking, and therefore the Messiah. Probably, they probably won't like humanly speaking, but so I can change that later on. Paul described the uh, the son as gospel content has centered on Christ, even though it is God's gospel. Um, that actually can go up here, I think. Yeah, I'll just leave that. Paul's gospel is in fulfillment of the Old Testament. So that we've kind of already said that, but we can go back and look at this here. Son who was born in the sin of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God, power and resurrection, according to the spirit. So he doesn't, he only time he mentions the scriptures is right here in two. So Paul's gospel is a fulfillment of the Old Testament concerning his son who was born in. Yeah, that is definitely the emphasis here is a fulfillment of the Old Testament uh, is in fulfillment of the Old Testament. Uh, that's an ambiguous phrase, but it gives me enough of an idea that I can come in and rework it. So Paul's gospel is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. So it's saying it's in harmony with it, basically. And so if we're in two, we get tired again. <sighs> Here he spoke or wrote about the five cents set apart. I'll just put it there for now. Okay, now right here, gospel God has centered on Christ, even though it is God's gospel. these statements right here I can't remember who exactly said them so I'm going to go ahead and put them here and I can adjust footnotes and those issues later on but um, passage of race is supremacy and centrality of Christ I say centered on Christ here and supreme is I mean it's contextually fine uh, in other words it's not needed and it contrasts the human existence and divine exhortation related to representation. Yeah, that's a true statement, but it's not really needed. I mean, uh, we already know that's what's going on here. The Davidic covenant is alluded to. Because, all right, so let's see. 
Davidic son. Okay, this this seems to flow together because the Davidic covenant is alluded to because Christ is the Davidic Messiah and resurrected Lord. Uh, all right. Jesus fulfills what is written in the law of the prophets. That sounds like uh, let me move this one here and stick it right here. So the Davidic son relates to the doctrine of sanctification. Yeah, but I haven't explained what I mean about that. Basically, the idea is, is that um, Christ went through sanctification as well, not because he was a sinner or, or you know, and any of that stuff, but you know, he learned obedience to what he suffered. Experiential sanctification is not about stopping sinning. It's about maintaining fellowship. It's about serving God, you know. So, so the Davidic son relates to the doctrine of sanctification. Uh, that's true. This section on experiential sanctification, uh, Christ is described. So maybe should, this should be in this. section on spiritual sanctification christ is described according to the flesh okay so was christ while christ doesn't need positional salvation now this could be in a footnote he always had experiential sanctification christ is the faithful obedient servant and implicit example jesus fulfills what is written in the law and the prophets so there is a statement that sounds like we have a uh, re repetition going on here. Okay, so we can remove that. God's declaration of the Son relates to the doctrine of sanctification, and that's true. Um, so you can see that this was a basic structure that I was initially using. Um, not sure I'll use it. <sighs> okay. I'm done for now. Thank y'all. Um, if this benefited y'all in any type of way, then uh, or any of our other stuff has, uh, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, give us a thumbs up, keep this ministry in prayer, most of all. God bless.